asset managers, central banks, institutions, governments, the elite. All of these seem to control the world. But the question is, who controls them? Well, the answer appears to be the United Nations, which seems to be almost the de facto global government. As it turns out, the UN has been pulling the elite strings for quite some time. So today, we'll discuss the UN's latest Summit for the Future and tell you which strings they'll be pulling next. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the United Nations, here's everything you need to know. The United Nations, or UN, is the world's third major attempt at a peacekeeping entity following the Concert of Europe, which was founded in 1815 and ended in 1914 as World War I broke out, and the League of Nations, founded after World War I in 1920 and which collapsed at the start of World War II in 1939. The United Nations was founded in 1945 at the end of World War II. When the UN was first created, it had 51 member states. Today, it recognizes 193 countries in the world and has all of them under its belt, so to speak. Now, the UN's primary purpose is to uphold peace and prevent war, but it also has a long list of other responsibilities too, such as humanitarian efforts. These include protecting human rights, supporting sustainable development, and overseeing international cooperation. The UN also has its own military, which is tasked with global peacekeeping. And the UN even published a blog post on its website proposing a digital army to basically fight the spreading of misinformation online. As you'll no doubt know, this is basically code for limiting free speech. In any case, having a global entity supposedly dedicated to protecting the welfare of Earth and its inhabitants may sound all well and good, but there's a big problem. You see, when a major institution like the UN says there's a global crisis of some sort, well, logically, there has to be a global response. This response would have to come from governments around the world, and the only way this response could really be coordinated is by a single global government. This is basically what the UN is designed to be. Anyway, scary thoughts aside, the UN has 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, that all 193 member states have to meet by 2030, which is why you see a lot of companies working towards targets like zero emissions by 2030, etc. This is also why countries are rushing towards CBDCs, digital IDs, and smart cities. If you've watched any of our videos on these topics, you'll know that this dystopian tech is being pushed by the biggest corporations and governments, and is designed not only just to track your every move, but to control your every move. And you can learn more about these technologies by using the link in the description. Hey man, hey, what do you do for a living? Me? I'm a, uh, I'm a crypto YouTuber. Yeah, yeah it's a pretty, pretty fun job, actually. See ya. And what about you? What do you do for a living? Oh, me, man. I checked the Coin Bureau deals page. It's got sign-up bonuses of up to $100,000 and trading fee discounts. But I mean huge trading fee discounts. And exclusive altcoin alpha in their subscription service. Check it out. Now, the UN holds an annual General Assembly Summit every September. The latest summit took place in New York on the 22nd of September and attracted over 4,000 people, ranging from government officials and heads of state to civil society and non-government organizations. In the two days prior to the summit, the UN held a so-called Action Days event, which was attended by more than 7,000 people from all walks of life. In other words, the plebs were allowed to the teaser, but only the elites were allowed to the main event. Per a UN press release, the Action Days event received various commitments to action by stakeholders and over a billion dollars in pledges to go towards digital governance. Not for the entire efforts of the UN, but just for digital governance. That is a mind-melting amount of money. Anyway, according to that same press release, this summit was one of the most ambitious gatherings of world leaders in many years, not only covering a broader-than-usual agenda, but with some issues that countries haven't been able to agree upon for decades on the agenda. But what was the purpose of this meeting? 
Well, it was to create the so-called Pact for the Future. Now, the goal of the Pact for the Future is to give institutions a framework to adapt to the modern world. In the words of UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, quote, We cannot create a future fit for our grandchildren with a system built by our grandparents. Key global issues covered in the pact include peace and security, sustainable development, climate change, human rights, and what was it? Oh yes, global governance. Well, at least they're not being secretive about it. What's crazy is that the UN describes the pact as, quote, a strong statement of countries' commitment to the United Nations the international system, and international law. Now, this is nuts because it's basically bragging about the power and control the UN has over these countries. If you watched our previous video on the UN, you'll know that once a country is part of the United Nations, it's almost impossible to leave, even if it wants to. Anyway, the press release explains that the Pact for the Future is based on the inputs and expertise of governments, civil society, and, quote, other key partners. In this case, that would be the public sector, with entities like the World Economic Forum, or WEF, and the private sector, with institutions like the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, and the World Bank. As you can imagine, this opens the doors to all kinds of corruption, and the fact that these organisations aren't even mentioned in the full 66-page document only creates more suspicion. But what did this 66-page document actually reveal? Well. It contains a total of 56 actions aiming to achieve five objectives. We'll leave a link to the full report in the description, but if you'd rather put your time to better use, then don't worry, because we'll be breaking it down for you right here. Now, the first objective of the UN's Pact for the Future is to support sustainable development and improve developmental financing. What's crazy is that the UN's press release literally says, quote, the entire pact is designed to turbocharge implementation of the SDGs. Why is this crazy? Well, remember when we said that the UN is rushing towards rolling out things like CBDCs to reach its 2030 goals? Well, considering we're approaching 2025, the UN basically has just five years left to implement all the changes needed. Put differently, the UN is more desperate than ever to get these things rolled out. It's not all doom and gloom, though. Another planned action is to eradicate poverty and end world hunger. And there are also plans to close the financing gap for developing countries to allow them to meet their SDG targets, which the UN says is a major concern. This is likely because, as the UN itself points out earlier in the report, without participation from every single country, the whole thing falls apart. Other action plans include the upkeep of a sustainable trading system and investing back into the people in order to boost social trust and cohesion. In other words, give the plebs a bit of money, and that'll keep them quiet. There's a whole bunch of actions aiming to protect human rights and gender equality. And not only that, but the pact outlines the need to protect human rights defenders with guidance coming from local and regional governments. Now, when it comes to ensuring peace and security around the world, the UN claims that this is the most radical commitment to Security Council reform since the 1960s. There are a number of actions highlighted that aim to build and sustain global peace. Some of these actions are a little far-fetched, such as the commitment to completely disarm all nuclear weapons around the world. It's very unlikely that this would happen. That's simply because it would be too much power for any country to sacrifice. Almost every nuclear weapon in the world is kept as an attack deterrent, so whichever country ditches that deterrent first would leave itself theoretically wide open to an attack from others. In any case, other actions named here are the sorts of things you'd expect from a global government trying to promote a more peaceful world. They include the obvious combating of terrorism and protecting innocent civilians in times of armed conflict. And in the case of those in need, the UN plans to ensure that humanitarian efforts are carried out so that everyone gets the support they require. Of course, prevention is better than cure, so the UN has pledged to promote cooperation and understanding between its member states in the hopes that this will diffuse any tensions. However, it also makes it clear that it will comply with the rulings of the International Court of Justice, or ICJ. In case you didn't know, the ICJ is a part of the UN and draws heavily from its predecessor, the Permanent Court of International Justice, which was established by the League of Nations, the UN's predecessor. 
Intriguingly, one action explicitly aims to tackle transnational organized crime and illicit financial flows, especially when these financial flows happen online. Could this be a veiled reference to crypto? Well, we ran a search of the 66-page document for keywords like cryptocurrency, blockchain, and Bitcoin, but none of them got a mention. Still, the wording hints at an attack on crypto nonetheless. Maybe that's just us being paranoid, though. Now, this ties into the next objective set out in the Pact for the Future, which is the focus on science, technology, innovation, and digital cooperation. I know, quite the mouthful. Essentially, the UN's action plans here are to take advantage of the latest advancements in technology to benefit humanity. There are also some rather outlandish commitments, such as preventing an all-out arms race in outer space. You know, because when global governments just isn't enough, it's time to govern the whole galaxy. Jokes aside, what this actually means is to govern the companies dealing with space exploration. So, think Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic or Elon Musk's SpaceX. And speaking of Elon Musk, his recent unveiling of Tesla's Optimus robots could catch the attention of the UN for other reasons too. That's because another peace and security focus is the avoidance of new technologies being misused and weaponized. Not to scare anybody, but, well, we've all seen films like Terminator and iRobot, right? Probably best we have something in place for those eventualities. Now, one part of the Pact for the Future is the Global Digital Compact, which the UN claims is the first comprehensive global framework for digital cooperation and AI governance. Essentially, the Global Digital Compact aims to get everybody connected to a safer internet, with protection for children being at the forefront of governance. Now, sounds great in theory, until you realize that in practice it would mean requiring a digital ID to use the internet to prove your age. There are also plans to integrate digital law and human rights, and to implement better data protection standards by 2030. Although it should be noted that the press release seems to suggest the opposite, saying the plan is to quote, make data more open and accessible with agreements on open source data, models, and standards. You can almost hear Mark Zuckerberg's circuits whirring with excitement. OK, the next objective set out in the Pact for the Future is the protection of younger and future generations. There's not much to say here, but basically, the UN's actions will involve investing in youth development and protecting the rights of children and young adults. This will aim to promote the social and economic development of the younger generation to allow them to achieve their full potential. In other words, investment in education. The Pact for the Future also has something called the Declaration on Future Generations. This is the first of its kind and basically puts future generations at the heart of decision making. And not only is the younger generation being protected, there's also the chance for younger people to have a say in future decisions on both the national and international levels. Now, as cool as this is, it's also kind of bizarre when you think about it. After all, Surely the whole point of the UN is to make the world a better place for our children to inherit. It makes you wonder why this is the first of its kind. It's almost as if the UN has thus far existed solely to serve the needs of the elites above anyone else. OK, and now for the really juicy part. The final objective of the Pact for the Future is the transformation of global governance. This one is by far the most important, and that's because it not only outright acknowledges the UN's role as a single global government, but also because it suggests that this global government is failing. In fact, there are more actions for this objective than any of the previous four objectives. So it's almost poetic that this is the final section. It's as if they save the best for last. Specifically, there are 18 planned actions to be taken for the UN to reinvigorate itself. These include a reform and strengthening of the United Nations Security Council. What's crazy is that the UN highlights the need to improve intergovernmental negotiations on the Security Council as a matter of urgency. This suggests that the UN is terrified of losing control and is desperate to whip these governments back into line. Other action plans include improving the relationship between its member states and increasing the efforts to revitalize the work of the General Assembly. Again, this suggests that the UN is quickly losing control. As a reminder, the General Assembly is literally the group of international representatives that had this meeting in the first place. The UN also wants to strengthen its Economic and Social Council 
and its Peacebuilding Commission, both of which are another part of the UN structure. So, in a nutshell, the entire body of the United Nations needs a good shakeup if it wants to maintain control. But here is where things get insane. Not only does the UN plan to restructure the way it operates, but it also has plans to accelerate the reform of the international financial architecture. The key word that jumps out there is accelerate, because this heavily implies that the wheels are already in motion, which, as we already know, means the rollout of dystopian central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs. There are six actions that relate to this financial reform, including plans to strengthen the voice of developing countries and finance the progress of the SDGs. The UN also wants this reform to be able to ensure that countries can borrow money more efficiently and have access to emergency funds in the event of another economic crisis or complex global events, like another pandemic, for instance. So then, what happens next? Well, as the UN highlights right at the start of the report, its plans of achieving its SDG targets will fail if it can't get all of its member states on board. The obvious problem there is that a lot of the actions discussed in this summit aren't all that realistic, and non-compliance is inevitable. If what the UN says is true, then this means that the SDGs will inevitably fail. The thing is, even if they do fail, the UN will probably just rebrand them and try again. This is exactly what happened before, because the SDGs themselves were originally called the MDGs in the early 2000s, with similar goals that were supposed to have been achieved by 2015. When these targets were missed, the UN relabeled them from Millennium Development Goals to Sustainable Development Goals. What's particularly concerning is that there's a lot of focus on restructuring the international financial system and to control disruptive technologies. If the UN wants to be able to give the global system a shake-up, it will most likely fight against anything that could make that challenge more difficult. This means that alternative systems, like crypto, will be on the radar. This could pose a genuine threat to global crypto adoption. Recall that the UN has all 193 countries under its jurisdiction. This means that we could see new laws and regulations appear that aren't friendly to emerging technologies, be they crypto or otherwise. The caveat is that the US, the UN's most powerful member state, has been drawing a lot of attention to crypto's benefits. This is significant because the UN is deeply concerned that the US could stop supporting it, either by pulling funding or just leaving the organization altogether. This means that the UN is unlikely to do anything to rock the boat, so to speak. Although this arguably depends on who wins the upcoming presidential election. As you'll already know, the representation of crypto in presidential campaigns has been incredibly one-sided so far. More about that in the description. In the meantime, we can expect a whole heap of dystopian technologies to start being implemented between now and next September summit. If not by then, then at least by 2030, which I'll remind you isn't that far away in the grand scheme of things. And remember, you can learn more about what a dystopian future with CBDCs could look like in the description below. And that's all for today, folks. So if you learned something new, give this video a boost by smashing those like, subscribe, and bell buttons. And if you know someone who'd love this sort of content, take a second to share it with them too. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. This is Guy, over and out.